Hey, what's up everyone? This is Vegetarian Zombie and I want to welcome you back to Beginning Interactive Fiction with Twine and Sugar Cube video series. Man, that's a mouthful. In this episode, we're going to be covering if statements. And this is going to be a multi-part episode because there is a lot to cover. But in this episode itself, I'm going to introduce you to the basics of using if statements inside of SugarCube and how you can get up and running. In the next episode, we'll go into detail about some of the more advanced things that you can do with if statements, and I'll show you how you can use them in your actual game. But for now, if statements, what are they? What are they good for? Well, thankfully, the answer is not absolutely nothing. They are extremely useful. What they do is they give your game some interactivity. Let's face it, if you just made a game in Twine without adding any macros, without putting in any code, it would just simply be a branching storyline. And this is fine. I mean, the Choose Your Own Adventure books were hugely successful back in their day, and that was just a simple branching storyline. But with working on computers, we now have the ability to add logic into our games. Let's say, for instance, we want to create a jail cell, and we'll be doing something similar to this in the demo in the next video. But let's just say we wanted to create a jail cell, and we wanted the player to gain access to it. Maybe we provided a key somewhere. Well, if we were just doing this strictly in Twine without any code, we would need to rely on whether the player would play the game legitly. Let's say they found the key and they reached the jail cell. If we didn't have logic to check if they had the key or not, they we would have to have a branching storyline that would be something like, if you found the key, click on this link. If you didn't find the key, click on this link, or so and so forth. With if statements, we take away that decision making from the player, and rather we automate it. We do it ourselves. And this is good because the player shouldn't be thinking about game mechanics and inventory management. They should be thinking about the game itself. They should be experiencing our game worlds. Now, if statements allow us to do this, and we do this by using variables and checking the certain state of variables. Okay, the best way to really show you how to use an if statement is to demonstrate that. And here we are back in Depth Charge. This is the game that we've been working on throughout this series. Okay, I'm gonna open up this Brig passage here. And when we last worked on it, we were printing out whether how many times the player has died or not. And I've actually deleted that code. We're not gonna be doing that anymore. But that past assignment, that past demo is to show you how to work with variables. Now we wanna make choices based on those variables and we do it by using an if statement. So the first thing we need to do is create our own variable. Now at this point, we want to check to see how much money they have. And to do this, we're going to use the if statement. Like all macros inside of SugarCube, we're going to use the less than, less than. And this time we're going to type if. Now we're going to provide an expression. And an expression just simply is going to evaluate to a true or a false answer. For instance, instead of saying, what time did you wake up this morning? We're going to have to rephrase it as, did you wake up at 8 o'clock today? Or did you wake up earlier than 8 o'clock today? Did you wake up less than 10 a.m. today? Questions like that that ultimately boil down to a true or a false statement. In this case, we're going to see is does the player have $10? And we can do that by doing if dollar sign money EQ 10. And that's it. The EQ here stands for equals. So if money equals $10, and you can see here this is our expression. Now, after the if statement, we're going to close it up by doing a forward slash if, like so. Now, anything, if this expression equals to true, then anything within this code, anything within this opening if and this closing if will run. Otherwise, the code path will simply skip over that. So let's just write the player has $10, like so. Now let's run this. 
you're going to notice a few things when we do it. You can see, first of all, we got a lot of space. The if statement will produce white space, so you're going to have to work around that to make sure in case you want things to be flush. You can see here that it says the player has $10. So what happened here was that we set a variable of $10, or just 10, and then in the if statement, we checked to see if that variable equaled 10, and because it did, it printed out the player has $10. What if we change the value of money to be 11? Can you guess what will happen? Let's see. I'm going to play this again, and you notice that there's nothing printed out. What happened here was that we had set the value to 11. When it reached this if statement, this expression was evaluated. It checked to see the value of money. The value of money was 11, and because it wasn't equal to 10, the code path simply skipped over the if statement and kept on going. So we have equal, you've seen this, but believe it or not, we also have n equal. Can you guess what that means? That simply means not equal. If the money is not equal to 10, then we'll say the player does not have $10. Can you guess what's going to happen now if we run this? Well, if you guessed that it will print it out, you were correct. The player does not have $10. Now, I'm going to introduce something a little different. This is called, this is the is. We can say, if money is $10. Well, what is the difference between equals and is? This is where things get a little tricky. And if you're coming from a computer programming background, this will make some sense. But if not, you're, you may be confused. Before we dive into the differences, Let's talk about this value right here. We're assigning the value of 11 to money. This value is a number. How do we know it's a number? Well, simply put, there is no quotes. What if I did this? So when we look at this value and we compare it to this value, we can see that this is text. And we can tell that because we have quotes before it. That's the big difference. This is a number because there are no quotes. And this is text because there are quotes. Now, what happens if I did something like this? This is a number. But this, what is this? This is still text because, again, we're using quotes. Now, what if we tried to do an equal sign between money and quotes? What do you think would happen? Well, let's come here. We're going to say if money is equal to quote. We're saying does this 11 equal this text 11? What do you think the answer would be? Before we do check, let's just simply write the two values are equal. Now, we're going to run this, and you can see the two values are equal. What this is doing is it's comparing these two values, and it's ignoring what we call the types. It says we have an 11 for money that's a number, and we have an 11 here for the quote that's a text, but essentially they're both the same. They're both 11. And... That's not necessarily true, but as you can see, it kind of is. They're both 11. One is just represented as a number, and one is just represented as text. Now, if you wanted to be very specific, if you wanted to say, well, no, I don't want these to be equal because money is a number and quote is text, and there's no way those two are going to be equal, then you use the is. This makes it a much more precise comparison. So if we now run this, notice we get nothing printed out here. So like we have the not equal, we also has is not, like so. In this case, if money is not quote, if these two values are not equal, let's print this out. 
And if we play this, you can see the two values are not equal. We also have greater than. And we can do this by doing GT. Is money greater than 5? And what we'll do is we'll just print out true. The comparison is true. So is money greater than 5? Well, is money, which is 11, greater than 5? Well, the answer would be yes. The comparison is true. What if we did greater than equal to 5 and we changed money to 5? Is the money variable greater than equal to 5? Well, the answer to that is true as well. Because they're both 5, they're greater than or equal to 5. You also have the ability to do less than and less than or equal as well. There's going to be times when you want to make compound checks. Let's imagine we're playing a game where we the player has money, but they also have skill levels, meaning they can purchase, say, a sword, but only if they have the money and, say, their strength is higher than 12. Let's create a variable to store the strength. We'll say the strength is 16. Now let's make this comparison. The way we would do this is first we're going to make the money greater than, let's say, 100. And we'll say the player has 500. But now we will also want to check to see if their strength is higher, greater than 12. We do this by using and. So we do and, and then we can check here. Strength is greater, greater than or equal to 12, like so. And we'll just write here, you buy the sword. Now, if we run this, you can see you buy the sword. The way this works is it first in the, the way this works is that in the if statement, this expression is value evaluated first. If this is true, then this next expression is evaluated. If these are both true, then this code is run. If either one of these is false, then the code path will simply disregard this code in here and simply skip to the end of the if statement. But what if you didn't want to unite these as an and? Let's say it's okay if the player is strength is greater than 12 or they have the money. In either cases, that will solve the requirements. Well, we can use an OR statement instead. And now if we run this, you can see we buy the sword. And let's change the money to say, we'll say that it has 30 gold. Now, let's run this. And they're still able to buy the sword because their strength exceeds the requirement listed here. In this case, this expression is evaluated and this expression is false and then it's going to, going to jump to this expression which is true which then enters this code path here. We can also check to see if something has been defined or not. Let's say we don't have strength. We haven't set a strength variable in our code but we want to check if that player has certain strength. This can be a problem. You're trying to check on a variable that you have not created earlier in your Twine game. Well, you can check to see if that variable exists. The way we would do this is we would type if def strength. If strength is defined. We can then write strength has been defined, like so. And then we'll close this here. Now we'll run this, and you can see nothing prints out because we haven't defined strength. Now we also have the inverse of def, which is defined. If we define strength, we have end def. If strength hasn't been defined, we'll say has, then we'll print out strength has not been defined. 
then we'll run this, and you can see here, strength has not been defined. Oftentimes, checking the inverse of expressions is really useful, and to do that, we use not. Let's say here, we wanted to check if money is greater than, we'll say greater than 15. In this case, this would be true. In fact, let's make this 40. If money is greater than or equal to 40, we'll say money is greater than 40, like so. Now, if we run this, you know this isn't going to print out anything because our money is 30. So if we play this, nothing prints out. Okay, that's fine. But say we wanted to find the inverse of this. Well, we could find the inverse of this by simply doing less than or equal, like so. But another way of finding the inverse is using not. We put not like so. Now, if I run this and I, we play this, you'll see that nothing happens. And I believe what's going on here is that as the code is evaluating, it's evaluating this first and then evaluating this second. Meaning we have a couple operations going on here at once and they're happening out of order. This is what we call the order of operations. And generally speaking, you don't have to be too concerned about it but when you enter a situation where an expression is not working the way you want it to do, then what you can do is then use parentheses. Parentheses simply increases the order of operations. What I'm saying here is I want this to be evaluated first. Money is greater than 40, and then we'll evaluate the not with it. We'll stop and we'll now run and you can see now money is greater than 40. It correctly evaluates this expression and then evaluates the not in conjunction with that. Typically you won't need to use the parentheses but in a situation like this when you're using the not or especially if you're using something like def like that then it may not work as exactly as you would expect it to and then you'll use your parentheses. Well, we've come to the end of this video, and in the next one, I, we're going to go into a little more detail with if statements and show them in how you can actually integrate them inside of Twine. There's a lot more to uncover, but I suggest you play around with these, get, an, get a feel of how they work, and later you'll see how you can really unlock the power of them. All right, everyone, I want to thank you again for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next video. See you then.